All right. Welcome back in, everyone, to the Go247 podcast. I'm Glenn West, the senior writer at the site, um, joined by Dylan Sanders, our contributing writer. Uh, you guys enter at your own volition here today. This is going to be a, a little bit of a, a different pod for us, uh, coming off of a, a really disappointing loss for LSU uh, in this regular season finale. Uh, the Tigers drop uh, to Texas A&M in College Station, 38-23. Um, we're going to get into some of the, the gruesome details of the game itself. But uh, before we do that, just wanted to, again, remind you guys just to please hit the like button on YouTube. Please subscribe on YouTube and just wherever you guys get your podcast from. That really helps us as we try to grow out our network. Uh, so that that's just always appreciated. Um, with that, you know, <clears throat> I think probably the bigger point we wanted to make now that this is, you know, almost a day. Uh, but whether you're whether you know where whenever you're really viewing this, it's probably around a day after LSU has dropped this uh, this game and fallen nine and three. Uh, we just wanted to offer, I think, just some more overglowing perspective on this year and um, just kind of what the the season has meant, uh, at least in year one in our eyes. Uh, I think that was probably a bigger point of emphasis for us after watching that game last night. <laughs> Look, LSU did not do. Uh, a lot of things well uh, on Saturday night against the Aggies. I think they were controlled in the trenches on both sides of the ball. Uh, anybody who watched that game from start to finish could see that. Um, there was a ton of momentum swings there that just didn't fall LSU's way in the second half. You know, LSU's been such a great second half team all year. Um, those those adjustments didn't last for long, at least on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, just you know, pretty religiously getting attacked by. Devon A. Chain and and you know the entire Aggies rushing attack that was uh, just not a not a great performance overall for the Tigers. But we do want to just offer some uh, overglowing perspective here. And you know, look, I think if you had kind of told me heading into this year, um, LSU would be in this position where they get to nine wins. Um, not only do they get to nine wins, but they get to play in the SEC championship game uh, in year one under Brian Kelly. Uh, it, it's a scenario that I think. Most LSU fans, most people that follow this program uh, pretty closely would have taken 10 times out of 10. And I think probably the where some of the disappointment comes in uh, is that they this is probably a team that ex- exceeded expectations. You know, I think we probably got uh, a good glimpse of what the, the ceiling for this team is in that Alabama game um, and, and what the floor is for a game like last night. You know, it's just you're never going to be as high as you were against Alabama. And I don't think you're ever going to be as low as you are against Texas A&M. Like there, there's a, there's a nice little mean there in the middle that LSU falls under. And uh, it just so happens that, you know, it it costs them a trip to the college football playoff, or at least to to stay in that picture um, here in this game. But just, I, I thought it was important to really kick this thing off with a little bit of perspective on, on that and just, uh, you know, talking about this team as a whole, I think there were just so many great strides made this year uh, with their younger players. Um, you know, this was always going to be a, a multi-year rebuild, and I think LSU's got a huge jump start on it. And we'll, we'll touch on you know how it's impacting recruiting and and all that stuff, but really the young talent on this team. I mean, you're you're seeing it right before your eyes with Harold Perkins and Will Campbell and Emory Jones, Mason Taylor. Um, a lot of these freshmen and sophomores who were earning playing time so early in their career, that's just a, a really positive development that I don't think you probably would have seen, uh, you know, kind of coming into this year. I didn't expect Mason Taylor to be the, the kind of big play tight end that he's become over the last several weeks. I didn't expect Will Campbell and Emory Jones to be some of the best offensive tackles in all of the SEC and in, in their first year as, 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 you know, the starting tackles for this group. So, uh, just a lot of positives that you can take from this season as a whole. And I just thought it was important to add add another layer here on, on just the importance of this season and what getting to nine and three, what competing in this game uh, against Georgia next week means for the program uh, in year one under Brian Kelly. But Dylan, I'll just throw it over to you just from, from your perspective, just the overlying, uh, you know, Positives, negatives with this with this season. Just, just kind of where are you sitting uh, after watching that game last night? Yeah, I mean, after there are multiple times in this season where 
if you told me that we'd be sitting here doom and gloom, disappointed at nine and three, um, I would have been really, really shocked. Uh, you know, this miracle run, the way I put it last night was it's a, a worst case scenario into a best case scenario type of season. Um, realistically, yeah, I mean, going into the season, I said seven and five. And the reason that a lot of people are upset is because this team at times looks like it could be, you know, better than nine and three, better than 10 and two, potentially, you know, like looking back at old games, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the end everyone wanted, but it is um, not the worst thing in the world that this team went nine and three. I think a lot of, I think the blueprint has been set out for the future. Um, and I think once this team really uh, gets a chance to be built and be uh, constructed the way Brian Kelly wants it to, I think that this regime did a lot more good than bad this year. They weren't perfect. Um, I mean, obviously they lost 38 to 23 last night. But, um, you know, like Matt House had a lot more ups than downs. Brian Polian grew throughout the year. Mike Dinbrock definitely grew throughout the year. So if this is the the trio of coordinators that runs it back next year, there are things to be excited about with this team. There are players that aren't for sure leaving that could come back. And then, wow, you're excited for them next year. There are Masons. There are Mason Smiths coming back next year. There are freshmen that will play in this incredible recruiting class. Like I think everything, um, I think nine out of ten things that you point to are positive from this season. Um, it just sucks the way you lost and who you lost to to end the season. Yeah, I mean we'll, we'll dive into the game a little bit here, but I just wanted to bounce off of that a little bit. I mean. Not just the the coordinators. Like I, I I think LSU is in a really good spot with a lot of their position coaches. I think they have some of the brightest young minds in all the game in in terms of Jamar Kane, uh, Robert Steeples, um, Brad Davis, Brad Davis, Joe Sloan. I mean, like they're they're set up, I think, for long term success with the way that they uh, go about their business. Um, and and you could really see the impact that a guys like a Brad Davis had on that O line group. I mean, this was a O-line group at the very beginning of the year had no continuity, had zero chemistry. Uh, they were plugging and playing guys, um, you know, different lineups every week. Uh, they finally find some stability and they start growing together as a unit. And you, they've been one of the great success stories, I think, as the season's gone on, uh, on the entire roster. They've been really consistent for you for most of the season, uh, or at least as LSU's made this stretch here where they won five in a row and kind of vaulted themselves back into the national picture. So uh, that's just extremely encouraging, and that's just one example. I mean, you could go down the line, Robert Steeples and the effect that he's had on on some of the recruiting that LSU's right now in the mix for. Um, it, it, some of these transfers that came in and having them – build that uh, that chemistry pretty quickly in the secondary and and being a, a, a mostly reliable unit I'll say that there was some, there's been some hiccups this year but they've been a mostly reliable secondary for a group that was really just built back in January I mean this is you look at you know some of the all the players that are in the rotation right now for LSU and those, those all those guys are are you know, transfer in and and you had to learn the system learn how to play with one another and so um, I, I think there's just a lot of really good positives you can take away from this season. And yeah, of course, it was disappointing watching this game last night. Um, you know, just in, in a multitude of ways, LSU just didn't look like it was really well prepared, really well ready for this game. And I think that was probably the most disappointing, uh, the most defeated and most disappointed that I've seen Brian Kelly after a game all season. I think he really, um, was caught off guard by the way LSU performed, um, especially in the second half when LSU has been so great. Um, but I, I wrote this in our three observations piece. You know, you, you start slow all these games and you keep coming back and you keep finding ways to win and claw yourselves back into these games. But if you if you play with fire long enough, it, it, it could burn you. And that's, I think, what happened to LSU in the second half. It looked like they were right on the cusp of getting themselves back into this game and taking control with the back-to-back -back stops to open the third quarter and the touchdown there to start the third quarter as well. And 
then you have the the Jaden Daniels fumble that was returned for a touchdown. You have the uh, the third down penalty there, um, the the catch that wasn't uh, a catch for Jare Jenkins there at the end of the game. I mean, uh, just a lot of things didn't go LSU's way uh, in the second half, um, and some of it was them just beating themselves. And I think that was probably the most surprising thing, uh, you know, at this point in the season uh, for 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 Brian Kelly and and for that LSU coaching staff to swallow. Um, but when you look at this game, Dylan, I mean, just where uh, I mean, I, I think I know where the big turning point was, but just what was the, uh, the the series of plays or the turning point here for LSU and how they lost this game? Well, I want to point to one very misleading statistic that I noticed last night is that the time of possession was only a three three minute difference in favor of Texas A&M. They controlled the pace and the clock of this game from the jump Um, that very first 15 play 90 yard drive really set the tone for the game. And while LSU had some long sustained drives of their own, um, I would, I would say it, it didn't play into how LSU needed this game to play out. Um, And they were, they with their initial um, short drive led to that that led to that 15 play drive really just from the jump made this game seem like oh no (laughs) this is not gonna be good and it wasn't good and then you know they kind of got back into it and then of course the fumble really just felt like it was a one score game but it really felt like it sealed it like you're like oh wow this game's over like it was just that kind of play yeah I, I, I tweeted it out ex- after it happened, and I, I just simply said, like, anything can happen now. I mean, that was such a momentum swing in, in A&M's favor uh, because, I mean, LSU had all of the momentum on that uh, when, mm-hmm. when they were starting that drive. I mean, I, I think you could go back and look at that game and, and say that that was absolutely the, the big deciding factor in all of this. Um, I think I mean, what you mentioned about the plays is really interesting. Um, it wasn't just the 15 play drive; it was a 12 play drive that followed, a nine play drive that followed after that. That both led to points for A and M on offense. Um, you know, the second half they had two uh, eight play scoring drives as well um, that led to points, and so like that's a lot of on field time for the defense. Like you could tell those guys were gassed by the end of that game. Um, and, and it's, and it's really a credit to a and I think they did a fantastic job on their offensive line of pushing those guys back. You know, there was really no pressure uh, in the second half on, on Connor Wegman and uh, in, in getting into the backfield to stop a chain. I mean, he was, a one-man wrecking crew uh, with his 215 yards on 38 carries. It was just a, a really lopsided performance that we really haven't seen this LSU front seven get thoroughly blasted like that. Yeah, uh, allowing allowing six yards a carry on 38 attempts is just absurd. Yeah, and and and, it, and they were all like I wouldn't say they were they were easy runs, but they were runs where a chain was like he had so much room to navigate and he's such a speedy and twisty receiver or running back. He can just really get into the grooves of your, of your line. If you're not gap sound and you saw that, I mean, they were, he was just really running rampant on this LSU team and really consistently getting into the second level. Yeah. And it just felt so uncharacteristic for this team because they had handled the lead back so well. And then a chain coming off of an injury, not at a hundred percent. There were questions if he was even going to play and then he did play and he played very well and ran all over the defense. And it really just seems like a worst case scenario kind of night. You know, I I mentioned it on Twitter. It kind of, you know, it feels like it, but uh, the NCAA a couple years ago tried to force this into a rivalry LSU, Texas A&M, you know, everyone's like, well, what happened to Arkansas? Why aren't we playing them rival week? They, they forced this one. And uh, through many a years now, uh, a bunch of annoying games, I feel like they've succeeded. I feel like these two schools don't like each other at all. I don't think these two and, like each other. And I think these games have proven that this is a legit rivalry. Like This they, is close. I mean, it's back and forth. You really never know what's going to happen. It's always going to be something weird. 
LSU controlled this series for the first, you know, six or seven years when a and got into the conference. Um, that seven overtime game, it's hard to look at sure. as a, a, a game that didn't really start to turn the tide and make this a, a real rivalry um, uh, back in 2018. And really since then, it's been back and forth. I think they have equal amount of wins since that 2018 game. Um, and uh, it's it's just a – it's it's one of those games now that I think if you're looking at a nine game schedule uh, for the SEC and you're looking for three permanent teams, uh, I don't know how A and M is not on the list for for LSU every year. I think that's a a, 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 a opponent you can certainly check off as a, as a one that that the conference would love to see every year. Yeah, it's uh, it's really worked out in the SEC's favor. Um, yeah, yeah. Ever since the nine, seven overtime game, it's just it's it's been something weird, and uh, you know something you can't you can't count on the A and M win like you could uh, for many years at the start. Yeah, uh, like they went. They obviously they didn't play every year, but there was like a twenty year gap in between Texas A and M beating LSU and uh, vice versa. Yeah. Um. But yeah, now it's now it's crazy. Even last year, LSU was a cr- one on a crazy last play. Like, yeah, and and A and M had something to play for. I mean, we talked about mm-hmm. it last week. They were on the cusp of a potential New Year's Six Bowl uh, with that win, and now it's kind of funny that only a year later, it was the other team that's dashing the the other team's hope of of getting into a New Year's Six or a college football playoff appearance. So. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it just it speaks to Brian Kelly's message of the SEC is hard to win game. It's hard to win in the SEC, and I think this really just proves it. I mean, imme- a team immediately as as A and M built out that lead, I went back and I grabbed the quote that Kelly had uh, at the very beginning of this week, and it was something that stood out to me on Monday, and it certainly stood out to me in the second half of watching that unfold. You don't want to be around this team when they figure it out. And you could see mm-hmm. that that was an A&M team that started to figure itself out offensively. They were healthier. Um, you know, Wegman really seemed comfortable in what was his fourth start. Um, so he he was hitting yeah. Evan Stewart and, and Muhammad, this guy Muhammad. Moose Muhammad out of nowhere making – Legacy game or something. I mean, he – Crazy, a, crazy dude. plays. Yeah, just, just – Sage, really Sage Ryan that. didn't even play those – balls horribly no it was just in absurd bad luck and crazy catches uh by by moose catch, i mean if anything i thought ryan was going to get flagged for a pi there if he didn't get the touchdown mm-hmm. catch um because he was pretty locked in with him and he looked like he was grabbing his right arm and so he just stuck out his left and made the catch but um yeah let, let, let's just shift maybe offensively just talk touch on the offense a little bit for LSU. You know, my personal opinion didn't, didn't really look great. I mean, I, I I thought they, they were able to uh, open up some running lanes for Jaden. I tweeted this out at the very start of the game. It just felt like it was a game where LSU was going to have to really rely on Daniel's legs. Um, And they did for a time. I mean, he had 84 yards rushing on the ground. He was pretty consistently moving the sticks on those nice long drives uh, in the first half. Um, it was great to see John Emery have a little bit of a bounce back game with his three touchdowns and uh, almost 60 yards on the ground. So um, there were some positives there in the run game, but the offensive line just didn't hold up very well last night. I mm-hmm. thought, especially in the passing game, um, you know, Jaden was flushed out of the pocket a lot, uh, a lot quicker than maybe he had been earlier uh, in these previous, you know, three, four games. Um, and he just wasn't, he wasn't hitting the passes like he was uh, earlier this year um, for that stretch run. Just, just didn't think it was um, the offense's most efficient night. Um, the, the fumble certainly turned things around. I mean, that's uh, that was the game changer, I think, in everyone's eyes. But um, yeah, I mean, after that, though, I mean, even the the penalties that you got on that next drive that that cost you uh, a potential third down conversion on on a first down play. Uh, instead of looking at third and six, you're looking at third and 16 and you're not able to, uh, to, to move that drive on the very next one and you force a punt and A&M goes down and scores a touchdown and pretty much puts the game away. So uh, just uh, some really uh, inefficient offense, I thought, in the second half. They just weren't able to match what they did in the first half. Um, and it was just the kind of game plan that A&M drew up. I mean, they wanted this to be a, a, a clock 
you know, management issue or clock uh, controlling the clock kind of game for them. And uh, LSU kind of got sucked in a little bit, I think, to, to that kind of kind of strategy and they weren't able to uh, make enough plays down the stretch. What were, what were your thoughts offensively? Yeah, I mean, Daniels made some nice throws. Um, obviously, yeah, runs like, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, but, uh, you know, it was really scary for a second there. Both of Jaden's <laughs> injuries looked like they were going to be way worse than they were. Yeah. It made very little sense to me going for the two point conversion yeah. with a hobbled quarterback. That was, that was the, the oddest. Issue. It really didn't. Uh, yeah, I agree. It didn't look like the smoothest offensive game, but it didn't until that fumble, it really felt like, okay, well, they'll be able to get something done. Like they, they had a little bit of uh, a few moments of, of fluidity um, and they looked like they could get the rhythm going. I thought, you know, as soon as, you know, 17, seven, they got the ball back and could take the lead. Yeah. It went immediately from that to 38 to 17. And then in the span of like, six minutes, yeah. Six yeah. Seven minutes. I mean, it was a onslaught from there. Um, and as soon as A&M grabbed just the slightest bit of momentum, and that was like the pinnacle moment of momentum that they can absolutely hope for the, the yeah. crowd, which is into it for the rest of the game. I mean, I think that, you, you saw LSU come out of the, fir- the third quarter and really shut the crowd down early with its stops and with the touchdown. That that fumble, I mean, it was off to the races from there. It was pretty loud in, in that stadium from from pretty much the end of that game on. Um, and you could tell they just they took advantage of the momentum and they didn't relinquish control. So um, I think it was just a, a a game that was defined by a couple of mistakes from LSU, um, a couple of uh, you know just and it just execution was not there. Uh, that was something that, that Coach Kelly mentioned after the game. Just he he didn't have he didn't have much of an answer for why LSU looked the way that it did, for how they uh, just didn't look like themselves for a lot of that part of the second half, and uh, it, it really hurt them. It just it just hurt them down the stretch. So um, you know, with that, I think we could probably turn it over to maybe a little bit of Georgia talk. Um, I think you know the. The biggest thing now that you want to see from this group is for them to flush this, um, put in um, as great a week of work of prep as you can hope for, um, and, and and enter this game with uh, you know the same level of confidence that you did earlier this year in a game of like Alabama, for example, or Ole Miss. You know you want to see that energy, and that was something that Coach Kelly said was lacking in the last 24 hours of this last weekend's game. That was the other thing that I wanted to bring up was. There was a little bit of a, a, a let guard, a letdown in terms of their guard, in terms of their energy level on that Friday um, before the game, the 24 hours before kickoff that Coach Kelly could kind of sense. Um, and LSU just can't afford to let that happen again. They've got to be extremely well prepared for this Georgia team um, if, if they want to have a chance of hanging tight with these guys. Um, Georgia is number one for a reason. They're one of the best – uh, defenses again in the country. They're extremely good against the run. Um, really, really solid against the pass as well. Um, but there's, you know, there's, there's some, there's some avenues here to to success for LSU, which we'll get into uh, later down the week. Um, just early thoughts on Georgia, Dylan. Just the, the mindset, the focus, the intensity that needs to be there uh, in order to be able to compete with these guys. Uh, you know, I, like an idiot, was thinking that this game was, uh, you know, going to be closer than it might end up being, you know, depending on how LSU responds. But, uh, you know, it's – Georgia has stumbled throughout the season. They recover usually because they have – Really good uh, the, the, the old uh, The old Shane Beamer quote of <laughs> how many five stars they have on each side of the ball, it's just absurd. Or the Marcus so, Sears post-it note thing. There's a five star. There's a five star. A, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, yeah. their their team's really really good, and they're coached really really well. So it's it's gonna be hard. It's not impossible though. Georgia has has shown weaknesses, uh, so LSU really does need to just lock in, and maybe this is the kick that they needed for this year and years on. You know this this team has been through a lot. They were, you know they fought through adversity so maybe we thought okay they've they've been through the ringer they know not to overlook anybody but it sounds like they did 
And this is maybe just what the players that are coming back next year needed to know that, you know, you you just can't do that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're playing against a a team that's not going to be making a bowl game in the last game of the year. And you give up them, give up 40 points. um, Yeah. Something went wrong. So they need to take a look at themselves this week and really, uh, you know, figure out what went, went wrong in preparation, but you know, Georgia is <laughs> good. Stetson Bennett, forever the most underrated player in the in the country. Like, he is a really good quarterback. He's a really um, good college quarterback, yeah. He, really, really good college quarterback. <laughs> yeah, specify college quarterback. I mean, like, there, there, is, a there, is, there is a difference, yeah. You can be a really good college quarterback and just not have much of an impact in the next level because that's just – Part of it, you know, that's just yeah, but you, you know, know, and he, you know, he, not he's better than one percent of the one percent, so yeah, he's um, what like 26 years old. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he's up there, he's a veteran, he's he's a leader, he's a leader. Um, and he is, yeah, he's the postman, yeah. he, he's good, he's good. That George is good. I don't know how, how what else you need to know. They're good, they yeah. can run the ball, they can throw the ball, they can uh sack you they can intercept you they can force you to fumble you just have to bring your a game that's about it if lsu plays like they played against alabama they could absolutely be in this game um yeah, I, I agree. The, the the defense defenses have been able to figure out georgia a little bit this year until the end of the game they break against the the you know the talent barrier but it's it's possible it's not yeah. it's not it, it's going to be a lot harder uh, just from a confidence level, you have to be, you have to believe you're going to beat them to be able to beat them. So, yeah, yeah it's just going to be harder. The one thing I'll add, especially offensively, is Brock Bowers is a dog. Like they better have a a good scheme for Brock Bowers, the tight end uh, for Georgia, because he will absolutely cook LSU if they're not careful. So you mean Mason Taylor Light, according to Brian Kelly this year, <laughs> earlier this year? Well, I don't think he called him Mason. I don't think he called him Brock Bowers, but he uh, he said he said he'll be the he'll be like that quarter, that tight end from Georgia oh. was I think his exact quote. <laughs> All right. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean he's Mason Taylor Light. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that yeah, it was one of the no. That's what that, I'm reading through the lines. That's what Brian Kelly meant. Yeah, that was one of the more interesting BK quotes we've heard this year for sure. I was a little thrown back, thrown off by that one. But, um, yeah, so, look, we'll be back in the middle of the week to, to preview this game. Uh, we'll be have boots on the ground in Atlanta for, for LSU's SEC championship quest. And, look, I think just a parting thought here, you still have something to play for this year if you're LSU. This is mm-hmm. a great opportunity to build some momentum heading into next year. Um, and, and what is probably going to be a – a team that returns a lot of its key starters. I mean, I think that there's a argument to be made that this this LSU team is going to have a lot of familiar faces around the building back in this rotation next year. Uh, and so whatever kind of momentum that you can build, confidence you can build uh, heading into that offseason, um, it, it, it's it's only going to help this program. And, um, you know, with that, uh, we'll, we'll certainly – keep you guys in the loop of what's going on uh throughout the, this week they've got a lot of press conferences a lot of interviews scheduled with kelly and the players so um we'll, we'll have all that content for you at go 247 but until then uh, we'll check you guys later